Right, so there's no amazing suggestions for, for this, aside from tech stuff that had already been done. So I'm basically just going to talk through what I've done and the crap that I've come up with. So, back to times of me, basically. 2.0 because I've done a bit of this talk before and I've extended it. So I hope you're all ready, good three or four hours. Be fine. Make yourself comfy. Right, so back in the day, and a real back in the day, 1983 was when I really started. A friend of mine got one of these, uh, ZX81, that a lot of you obviously know, uh, with that wobbly ram pack, which you should try not to touch. And we used to play lots of the old kind of games you got then. There were the blocky versions, high res stuff didn't come out for a good couple of years yet. So we actually played things like backgammon more than anything. I have no idea how to play backgammon anymore, not a clue. But what it also had that everybody will know is it boots up straight into basic. And that's when it got interesting because it's like, oh, you can do stuff with this. And I vividly remember the first bit of basic we did was to do a for loop that printed block along the screen. It's like, oh, we drew a line. And then it was, well, we could print that with a space to the left of it and do it again. And all of a sudden it's a moving block. And it's like, that's what games do. Isn't that cool? So that was really our hook for getting in is just start fiddling with that. Now my pal wasn't really interested in making stuff. It was, it was me that was wanting to fiddle. So he upgraded to a Spectrum later on and my mother, bless her, bought me his uh, ZX81. Uh, we weren't exactly well off, struggled. So how she found the money for this, I have no idea, but it was just a godsend. We also had a portable TV, which was unusual for the time. I mean, the 80s, having a portable TV in my bedroom was just <laughs> impossible. Um, so I was able to sit there and just focus on playing and doing stuff. Um, and that went on for a while until this magazine came out. Now back in the day, you obviously had these magazines that had listings in them. And you get them and you post them, there'd be loads of basic stuff. And, oh, you know, it's an adventure game or this. And that wasn't terribly interesting. I sit and type them all in. Because, again, I was more interested in making stuff. But when this one came out, it was interesting because it had a listing of assembler in it. Now, normally, you would get assembly listings, which would be a tiny little program and a big load of hex numbers that you had to type in, usually getting several of them wrong and it all just crashing. But what's good about this one is it had these strange instructions down the side of it along with the kind of hex numbers and all of a sudden i could see those hex numbers mean something and look that's like i could kind of understand that so you can see here just i've kind of outlined and you know marked bits and that's where i started typing these the hex numbers in and, and poking different values in and changing it and I discovered the first wee bit here down to that ret is draws a border on a ZX81. Now, in the basic time that I'd been playing with it, you know, draw a border, we go do 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 because ZX81 was really slow. With this, it went poof, straight up on the screen. It's incredibly fast. And so I did another bit of hacking with it and changed it and got it to put random numbers in and the border was just flashing incredibly quickly. And all of a sudden you see how fast these machines are compared to what basic actually gave you. It was incredible. It was, it was one of these big eye-opening eureka moments. It was phenomenal. So from that point, I started playing with Assembler. Um, I did manage to buy an Assembler and debugger for it. It came on tape. It took 20 minutes to load each of them. So I'd wait for 20 minutes to get the Assembler, then get the debugger loaded. So 40 minutes, I do a few lines of code, run it, crash, start again. <laughs> or the ramp pack would wobble, start again. So I took to looking at the window quite a lot. We had a nice view, so it was fine. Um, but I did start making things and doing little bits and pieces with it. Now, while I've had that, uh, my mum's office, my mum used to work in a solicitor's office, and they had a massive computer. I mean, you're talking kind of this size of desk with a wee keyboard, tiny little monitor, huge. And it was basically an accountant's thing. They had a little Rolodex, which for those that don't know, is like a roll of cards where they look up a number and get the information. Now, they'd asked my mum if I would be able to write them a database. I thought, mm, okay, I could do that. So they bought a ZX Spectrum and a really fancy keyboard. Now, nobody had these back in the day, but it was for proper typists, so they had to have a nice keyboard. So I had this for about a year. I wrote them a database. I got a nice disk drive system as well. Now, initially we had a wafer drive, but I might have accidentally broken that and we took it back to the shop. 
I did spill something over it and it refused to work again. I went, no, we don't like that one at all. We'll have the disk drive instead. It was a BBC disk drive um, attached to the Spectrum. It was amazing. So I wrote this database that looked up stuff on the disk and printed it on screen. What amazed them was that I could look up names or partial names and, and list the results and they could go, oh, it's number five. That's the one I was after. So they could remember part of a name, type it in, go, that one. They thought this was amazing. For me, it was just Spectrum Basic. Spectrum Basic has an in-string function where you can just search for a bit of a string in another string. So I just looked through and printed it. It was dead easy. It was all part of Basic. But they thought this was incredible. They didn't need this little Rolodex anymore. They just typed in a name. But so there it is. There's all the information. So I had this for ages. Then eventually they took it away, much to my distress. Before they did that, I did start Assembler on this as well because it's Z80, same as the ZX81. And it's also the only computer I wrote an assembly language function for that as soon as I finished it, I had no idea what it did. Not a clue. It was to print platforms like Manic Miner. So it would print a wee platform and then move along and loop and it could do diagonals and stuff. And I put it all in and it worked. And I looked at it, I don't know what this does. Not a clue. And I just finished writing it. So comment in your code if you're ever doing that. It's, it's good. So while I had the Spectrum, I had great fun. I got this, which was tape loading routine out of um, the ROM that somebody did. If you go through that, the sections of that that you can change numbers and you can speed it up. That's how all the turbo loaders were done on the Spectrum. Basically, copy the ROM routine, change a few numbers, and it went faster. But if you then fiddled with it a little bit, you got some interesting results. So I did one that loaded backwards because you just decrement the value instead of incrementing. Uh, I did one that loaded from two directions at once. Um, I think that there was a commercial game that did that as well. It kind of came back and did spirals and everything. Um, and it's basically all just copied from this. I also did one that loaded like 6,000 baud. Now, the normal routine is 1,500 baud. It takes about 10, 15 minutes to load. Turbo ones were 3,000 baud. That was pretty quick. Mine at 6,000 would load on one tape recorder, which was mine. Actually, it was my friend's that he let me. Um, it would only load on that. It was in a brilliant tape recorder. So it wasn't terribly commercial, but it loaded almost as fast as a microdrive. It was amazing. Just like bing, bing, bing for a screen. It's fab. But all these kind of things where you just fiddle with uh, programming uh, was great fun. Same with sprites. I got into doing like software sprites on the Spectrum. Didn't really understand it before the Spectrum was taken away. But it was, it was good fun. And just poking this assembler stuff uh, got me into things. Now... When that got taken away, I was left without a computer for about a year. It killed me. I didn't want to go back to the ZX81 after having the Spectrum, because who would? So the ZX81 said, oh, I don't want to touch that. I did write out some programs in paper on the ZX81. I could do it, but I can't be bothered. And then Santa got me a Commodore Plus 4. Santa almost got me a, an Aquarius. Because I said, oh, I'll have that, a ZX, I'll have one of them. And then I realized I was, don't give me one. Fortunately, Santa hadn't bought it yet, so this appeared, which was fab. It was 6502, so I got really annoyed because the opcodes are almost the same. Um, 6502 to Z80, you'd kind of do LDH over here, whereas 6502 is LDA. And I got really annoyed going, why can't I just recognize that A's over that sign? Let me carry on. Got really annoyed with that. I eventually got to grips with it. It had an inline monitor um, and a a line assembler. Now what line assembler does is you go into the monitor, you type in a, a program um, and it just poked it straight into memory. So it wasn't like you have your source and assemble it. It was just poked stuff straight into memory. I actually wrote this game down here, which is Freak Out, which is on web somewhere, um, completely in this line assembler. I did have an assembler for it, which used the basic um, editor and lines and stuff. I didn't like it. So I just used this poke into memory thing instead. To do that, you would end up basically writing functions and leaving huge spaces between things. So if you ever had to insert a line, you'd block, copy everything down, go back and fix up all the addresses by you know 10 or 16 or whatever, and then add in your new stuff with lots of knobs to leave more space. And I did the entire game here using that. And the front end was quite cool. It had like, like three scrolly messages with parallax and everything on it. It was all done with that. Oh, interrupts running and everything. It was all done just poking stuff into memory. Now, this machine also got me into 6502, which was um, where I then went kind of professionally to do games. Um, and I had this for a couple of years or so. Um, so 
I got quite far with it. Um, I wrote a character editor for basically making that game, so it could do a three by three square, you could go and modify the characters. Um, and I actually got that published in a magazine. That was my first published thing. So it was written in 86, it was published in 87. Um, I think I got 60 pounds for it. Don't know if that's good, but it was published, so I didn't care. That was it there, and I was seriously annoyed that they didn't put my name on it, so I couldn't show anybody. I was just, just everybody else is in the magazine had their name in it. Mine didn't for some reason, so never mind. But it was there, first thing published, that was, that was quite cool. After that, my beloved 64 Aww. appeared. And again, this was another friend who had this, and he was moving on to something else, or console, or just giving it up. Um, and I bought that from him with a disk drive. So I didn't have to live with the tape, which was great. Um, I got, for what it was, I got it really cheap. Can't remember how much it was, but no way I would have been able to afford the disk drive and everything else otherwise. Um, and with that as well, I, I went out and bought an action replay. Well, expert cartridge rather than action replay, which was the best one, obviously, because you could program it. Um, and hacking into games and finding out how they worked was just so much fun. Um, and I basically started in earnest to kind of learn the trade I was going to do. I made a few games. Uh, I, during the plus four time, we started going to this computer club where Dave Jones, Russell Kay, and Steve Hammond were. Um, and we'd all kind of start talking about stuff and things. I think that was the tail end of my um, plus four days where I basically was doing smooth scroll and stuff, but nothing really. Steve helped me with some of the, the breakout stuff. He did the graphics and levels and stuff on the Freakout game. The, the Freakout game, interestingly, um, I came up with a system for doing levels. I think each level ended up being about six bytes. I think it was about six or seven lines at eight bytes, it'll be. Um, so you define a character and then you'd, that'd be a macro. Then you define a line, that'd be another macro. So each level only had, use that one, that one, that one, that one. So it was like eight bytes per level. It's like loads of levels. Um, and the level editor is still in the game somewhere, but I have no idea where. So you could sit and go and make up lots of levels, which was great fun. So once we'd done that and I got the 64 and started learning, like little sprites and all that kind of stuff, um, we'd basically start making games together. So Dave and I might start a game and then that wouldn't go anywhere, obviously. And then Russell and I might start a game and that wouldn't go anywhere. And you just start playing with tech all the time. Um, one of the games that Dave and I started was this weird shooting game where it had a rotating eye, and out of each direction of the eye, it would fire a bullet, and that was your ship. Just the wacky stuff I used to get. It's like the Manic Miner days, just weird and wacky stuff. But it was basically starting to learn all the different tricks and all the stuff you could do with these things. So I had nice smooth scrolling, sprites all over the place. Hadn't started doing multiplexers at this point. Um, it was reading Zap64, uh, Andrew Braybrook doing Morpheus, he was talking about multiplexers. So you did these fixed scan lines and sprites moving from one to the other. I basically copied that for doing my first game, Ballistics. Um, that was the only the first multiplex that I wrote. Um, and then I also did Blood Money, which I don't think we've got anything on that in the DMA days. Um, so these were all, when we got Ballistics, Dave was basically doing Menace and he got a contract from Psygnosis, being promoted, <laughs> um, to do Ballistics and gave that to me. And that was dead exciting, but he also gave me the equations for it. So it was this big stack of 16 adds and multiplies. On a Commodore 64 is a nightmare. It's, it's just because it doesn't have a hardware multiply. So I had to sit and stay this and come up with a way of figuring it out, how I can make it fast enough, which I eventually did. Each multiply took about a scan line and a half. So whenever a ball hit another ball or something, it would take you know 32 scan lines or something just for that one collision, and then it would all ricochet off each other. So it was quite intense but just figuring that out took a long time and that was the first game that i did for Cygnosis and dma um it was crap if you go back and look at it now the collisions don't really work the balls come off at the wrong angles and stuff how it got published i have no idea um but back then everything was a little bit crud it was still the first game it got my foot in the door got me doing stuff and from that i went on to do blood money which was my dream 64 title so blood money omega that david written this big multi-scrolling shoot em up so I did that in the 64, had a ball doing it, had a really nice multiplexer that I borrowed from Armour Light. Um, Action Replay is the best hacking tool in the world for figuring out how things work. <laughs> Basically you go in 
and you find out where the interrupt routine is, you put in like color changes and stuff, and then you can watch how things move, how interrupts are triggered, and then you can trace through the code and figure out how they're doing stuff. So the Armalite multiplexer is basically a dynamic um, allocation of interrupts, which is genius. So you get eight sprites at the top, and then as soon as he needs another one, he gets the Y coordinate, then just above that, he creates a new interrupt routine. And then that starts setting up all the other sprites. And then the more sprites he needs, the more interrupts he'll have. When they're close together, he'll set them all up in the single one. As they get further away, you'll trigger the other one. So you have all these dynamic interrupts going on all over the place. When I figured that out, I was just oh, awestruck with it. It was amazing. Such a cool piece of program. It is the best 64 shooter and bit of tech I've seen. Um, so I copied that and uh, basically did my own version in, in Blood Money. Um, I had big sprites and stuff moving about, which was great fun. And got a nice review in Zap. Even though they had three people in the magazine reviewing it, only one person appeared at Psygnosis to see it. So memory sharing and, and telepathy, I'm sure. So that's all us there. Obviously not the fine specimen I am now. Um, that's me, Dave, Russell, Gary, and Back of Biscuit's Head, which is all we're allowed to show for legal reasons. Um, so that's me working on Blood Money. Um, I'm not sure what he's working on. I've got a feeling he's working on... Um, Brian did a, a debugger for ST and Amiga, basically a, a dev debugger that we could put into systems that took over the whole system. You obviously can't have like Monam or anything doing a debugger, so we wrote our own debugger. Um, so he's probably working on that, um, which was fun. My first games. So that's Ballistics at the top and Blood Mine at the bottom. Um, like I say, really nice artwork. Guy called Tony Smith who did the Amiga art also did the C64 one. Struggled a bit because of the double pixels and so on, but things like the jellyfish, still amazing on the 64. Beautiful artwork on it. Um, really hard for all the, the different sprites moving about. So I've had about 32 sprites being multiplexed, and every time I hit the ball, you have to get the proper mass for coming up, which mostly worked, give or take. Um, this was really cool. So the ST version, ST? Probably ST version of this screen. We were going to take it over and draw it all by hand and stuff. Um, then Russell K suddenly thought, I might be able to do that automatically. So we had a program called ILBM to RAW that took all the graphics and converted them. So he took in the ST one, asked me what the rules were for like 64 colors and bitmaps. I gave him that. And after a couple of attempts, he basically output this image from the ST all automatically. I did go in and like make the eyes a bit nicer and some of these bits. But I got bored pretty quickly, so basically the ball, the arm, the eyes, and the green bit there, I touched up a little bit by hand. When it came out, everybody was just, oh, look at that amazing piece of artwork. It was all automatic, pretty much. But it's such a nice image, and it just more or less went over. It's really good fun. And then we get onto this one, which none of you have heard of. So, Lemmings, how did that come back? So, Lemmings which you may or may not know, came about because of an argument. Now, when Dave was doing Blood Money, there was a, a graphic in there, the Atat Walker from Star Wars, the, the kind of two-legged one. Now, in Star Wars, people are about the size of the feet. You know, they come up to the feet and that's it because they're huge. Um, so when Dave was wanting to do a game with this, he basically hired this guy called Scott Johnson to come in, who we rescued from McDonald's. He'd been there for two weeks. We saved them, it was like Charlie's Angels. And took, them, took them away from all that. So he came in and started drawing them. They're all 16 by 16s. Now the sprite for the Atat, I think, was like 64. So it obviously comes up really far to the leg. And that's, that's not the scale, really. So I had this argument with him going, you need them smaller. They're like, oh, it's smaller. And he's going, no, you can't do that, you can't do that. So I decided he was wrong and decided to prove it. Um, this is the Atat that came out of Blood Money that we're going to base the game on. I like say 16 by 16, he'd be up past the knees. It's just the wrong scale. So I had a couple of inspirations from this. The first one was this guy, which is from Beachhead 2. Now, when I was thinking about him, I thought he was much smaller, I have to say. He's actually quite a big sprite, but the animation's beautiful on him. 64 obviously had the best animation. Everything else was rubbish. Um, but it's a really nice, smooth animation. It's like um, leaderboards in 64, it was gorgeous. Um, so cross between that and Oids, which have like little five pixel high guys, I figured, if you could get like maybe an eight pixel one, then you should be able to get good animation, but keep them nice and small, and that'll make the attack look really big. So, then we come on to this one. 
So, I drew this spiky haired little guy there. Now, he's actually about 10 pixels high. Once you had the hair on it, it's, it got a wee bit bigger. Um, but it was good fun, and, and I'd been drawing this gun over lunchtime because I was bored. And I thought, why not? And so once I'd drawn that, and I just did this thing, Deep has got this thing where you can pick up an anam and you can just paint with it. So I did that and put them there, and I did a wee burn down thing, which is from Oids as well. You could shoot them when they burn down. So I thought, oh, I could just burn them and kill them. Oh, that would be fun. And then I showed that to the guys, and they've fallen about laughing, going, that's, like, that's great. Russell Kagan is definitely a game in that. Now, they only saw this bit. That was, this stuff here wasn't there. Um, so once we start saying, oh, this killing's fun, isn't it? You could have loads of ways. Um, Gary Timmons then did these three, like in like five minutes. He just quickly sculpted them. Um, and then I did this one here afterwards. Uh, we just kind of squished. It looks like it's really crunching them, but that was just an accident because I didn't get the spacing right to go down nice and evenly. So I went, oh, I've got to fudge it. And, uh. So it looks really nice and squishy. Um, and it was, it's good. We, we came to this conclusion. It's, it's like the Wile E. Coyote thing, where there's just so many ways you could kill them that's fun. And it's like, there's got to be a game in there somewhere. Just wacky ways of killing them. It'd be great fun. So Gary then sat down and basically fine-tuned this lemming. So there's mine on the left, Gary's on the right. What's really interesting is he hardly changes it. There's the odd pixel here and there, but it just smooths everything out. You can kind of see the feet roll. Mines are obviously very flat. The hair doesn't move. So he put in the binds of hair, the slightly rolling feet. I think he changed like a pixel on the arm or something. It's very subtle, but it just makes it from that stiff to this beautifully animated thing. I learned so much from Gary about doing animation. It's just really cool. Um, it's obviously still the same psychedelic colors um, that we, we had before, but it's just so much smoother and more fluid. So the original colors was the PC's fault. Back then it was, it was VGA, it was the dominant machine. And you didn't have a lot of colors. We wanted to keep them down into a couple of bit planes so it was fast to draw because we wanted as many on there as possible. Um, the more bit planes you drew, the, the longer it would take. So if we get it in two bit planes, then we could draw it much faster. So that meant we were kind of limited to the color choice. So it was either going to be green hair, blue body, or green body, blue hair. Now, we obviously used that two-player one later, but we just decided this looked nicer, or it would have been flipped. Um, and that was the only reason it was these colors. There was no real, because Amiga could have picked anything. It was all down to just PC technical limitations that most things were in those days. And again, it's just that same character just come to life as a, as a lemming at that point. And it's interesting, when, we first sh when I first showed the Anum, that word came out, it's Russell Sweat, they like lemmings. Straight away, from that point on, that name just stuck. Um, thanks to that Disney documentary. So Russell was also the first one to do a demo um, where they all kind of drop down and follow this terrain. And he had this inspiration from Salamander, which I don't think I've got a clip of now, um, where on Salamander they fire the bullets and it kind of follows the terrain. And he'd been trying to figure that out for blood money because they wanted a missile like that. So it never made it into blood money, but he fancied similar technique for making them walk. And it's dead simple. They fall down and you keep checking pixels underneath them. So it's directly underneath the feet. They're only interested in that column. They hit the ground. And from then on, up to four pixels, they would just snap to that. And that would be them walking. Anything more than that, like four pixels up and down, they would basically start to fall. And they would turn into that faller animation. Over about a third of the screen, if they fell that distance, they'd splat. That's the core mechanic. And aside from that, you, you assign skills to them. So you'd have the floater where they would go down a set number of pixels, pull out the brawly, off the go, um, or everything else was just follow from that. But he did this initial demo, had 100 walking, just to show that was possible. This was only on a 286 machine, so it was really slow, like four megahertz, really slow. So like likes Amiga and everything else, you know, they managed pretty well with it. And it was basically just one gigantic bitmap that we were gonna do it in. So that was all the animations that Gary Timmons did. Uh, which you won't really see there, they're, they're online somewhere. Um, and he just spent ages, again, just doing these tiny little dots and pixels to try and make these fluid animations. And the amount of life he got into them was just incredible. Um, I think we've all done little bits of animations of lemmings at some point or other. And it's all been learned from Gary. 
um, doing these tiny little things. I was fortunate enough to be allowed to do the Lynx Lemmings panel. If you ever played Lynx Lemmings, not a lot of space on that screen, so you press the button, the whole screen becomes a panel. And they've decided, well, we've taken up the whole screen, let's have bigger animations. So I was allowed to do the animations for those. So I basically took Gary's one, you can see there, scaled it up and then smoothed it all out. So you get nice blobby hair and everything, they were quite good fun. Um, block them again. How you got it again and the, you know, the little bits that you had here, just really nice. Uh, floater. Again, just deep paint, zoom it up to whatever percent I want and stick it on a background with a shadow. And that turned into the Link Slimings um, panel, all animating away. And I think we had a fuzzy bomb and a nice counter and stuff on there as well. So that was good fun. I did, I was occasionally allowed to do graphics, but not very often. Uh, they had proper artists for that. Um, the Gary also did the, what came on the box. Because we started out with pix, the tiny little pixels, Signals was going, well, what do they look like? I don't know. I have no idea. So Gary went away, decided this is what they look like. And so that's what kind of appeared on the box to general terms. Um, he basically came up with the look of them. Now, the editor, he's got a lovely video on the editor now. Just put it on here. Should you make levels? Um, editor was great fun. It was like using D-Paint. Um, you just, like I say, it was, it was basically making a huge five screen wide bitmap and then you surround areas that you didn't want to be diggable, these metal bits. Um, although if you were sneaky, you could take little nicks out of them. Um, just because of the way the collision worked, it was, it was pretty poor. Um, but it was great fun. We spent oh, weeks and weeks coming up with levels to try and beat each other. So at the time, and not now, don't challenge me, we were master players. We could beat any level in seconds. They bring it on and go, here's my really hard one. You go, oh, let's do that, that, that. There you go. Be easy. Um, there's once or twice where that didn't happen, but in general, by the time we were making all these, no level could beat us. Uh, but we had great fun trying. And then they'd all get sent down to Psygnosis, they'd play test them, they were getting pretty good as well. And they'd come back and go, yeah, this one's good, this one's not. Um, I did have one called It's Hero Time, so he asked what my favourite level was. And it's got a little bit of lateral thinking, you've got to send a lemming over the top, hence the hero, and get him to do things while the other lemmings couldn't do anything, just kept plodding on. And the sheet we got back from Psygnosis at the time was, you know, it took us three minutes, four minutes, you know, two minutes. This one came back and the whole page was just scribbles and scoring out and this and this and this and some swearing on it. So they eventually did it. It was about an hour and a bit they took to complete it. Um, and they eventually did it and I, I was well chuffed because it was just, that's what you want. You want experienced players to not figure it out for a while. That was really good. So I did about, I think I got about 16 levels in. Um, Scott and Gary, they were the other ones that got the levels. Gary did all the two-player levels. Um, I did the special levels, where it's, you know, the Shadow of the Beast ones and stuff. It was basically, it was literally a deep paint picture. I got all the artwork from Psygnosis and I would just make a deep paint picture and Dave would put that in. Um, so they were good fun. Um, Gary is the one really that did that level progression that made Lemmings what it was, making it a nice slow progression of, of skills and, and getting you into it. He's also the one that basically him and Dave came up with that kind of tutorial without being a tutorial. And you get a single skill and you go, well, all I can do is this. And it kind of taught you the levels and how to use them, um, which is great. But level editor, fab fun. We had great fun with it. Uh, like I said, go and watch Neil's video on it. It's, it's good. Didn't like the Lemmings 2 one so much. Lemmings 1 level editor, it was great fun. Tupelo Lemmings. It is a shame it hasn't been on any of the other ones, it's particularly with the internet play these days. It would be such a good game to have across the, the net because um, you could be really evil. And we were wondering, because initially I, I actually did some test code where we had two megas hooked up with an all modem cable and I would control the mouse on another screen because we'd been playing Stunt Car Racer and Populous um, and we love these games. So I thought, well, maybe we'll do that as well. Um, but then Dave could just plug two mice in and figure, well, you don't have to cut your Amiga over or anything. So we came up with this split screen and it's amazing how focused you get on your own side of the screen without seeing what the other player's doing. So it's almost like having two screens because you just don't really pay much attention to the other one. And Gary was the master of two player. He's just evil. 
Um, you'd be trying to concentrate doing stuff and Gary would have sent a lot of lemming over to dig down or steal all your lemmings back or whatever. Um, he was really good at it. But two player one was great fun. And it was, it was just a kind of throw into, to, um, just using the engine to do something a bit more fun. The PC one couldn't have it because you couldn't get two PC DOS drivers to run at the same time. It was purely down to the tech of, of the drivers that you couldn't. But ST and Amiga, they could all have as many as they wanted. The end screen, um, Dave was just looking for some fun to put the end screen. Uh, Blood Money and Menace were pretty dull. So we had a Genlock, you remember those things? So I'd drawn this, we, we got, had a whole lot of shop advert stuff sent down. And one of them was a, a kind of bendy thing that came here and just dangled. It was basically this guy with lemmings underneath it. So I just taken it, I was drawing cartoon art at the time. So I'd drawn him and David, oh, we could just put everybody around that, like that. Um, yeah. It's got my ND down there. It's the only initials in the game because Dave didn't put my name in the credits because he's a <laughs> bad person. Um, but that was good fun. Um, and then we all cheered badly. So that was good. So after that, we did a whole heap of other things um, that I was involved in. So Shadow of the Beast and the PC Engine, Livings 2, um, which more of the same, but different tech in terms of how the level's done. Again, look at the, the video on the, the editor that kind of shows you. Higher Guns, where I was the T-boy, but I also did some level design and I did a level viewer in Highsoft Pascal, which I loved um, for displaying them all. It was really good fun. Um, that's a Kid Kirby game that got scrapped. Um, Unir Races or Unir Rally on the SNES, which was a great game. And then that's the Christmas Lemmings, which was actually really just a cover disc thing. It's coming up to Christmas. We wanted to remind people Lemmings was there. So we did some nice new graphics and friendly levels, which is why none of them kill you. So you don't get the snowman splatting you about. We want it to be nice. Turned out that was the wrong thing to do. People wanted to see that snowman beat you to death. <laughs> so our bad. Um, and then Signosis went, oh, people like that. Let's do a new franchise with that one. All right. <laughs> so that got funded. I pointed out to everybody else. Lemmings 3, which we won't talk about because it's awful. And <laughs> then Walker, which did finally come out with the little guys, which was kind of true to scale. I think they got them a little bit smaller because they would just be a bit more sticky, but it was, they were fine. And that's the Lynx Lemmings, Shadow of the Beast on the um, C64, which we also did. Um, that started out as a disc game and then moved to cartridge. So Steve Hammond got to do a bit of writing for the transitions and stuff, which he was all happy about. And then there was loads of little bits and pieces in between that I helped out on, just some tech stuff or, or whatever. I did the level editor on this, which was, you know, this is interesting because the levels could be 256 by 256 screens in size. So we got a big A0 plotter from Psygnosis so they could see them. So I had to write a print driver to print this massive level out. It was all these tiny little spindly lines. Um, but it was great fun. Um, and yeah, I did the Lemmings 2 version of that, which was a story in itself. But again, get to use the SNES, got a lovely dev kit for doing it. Good fun. Also had uh, Miyamoto up when we were doing uh, Lemmings 2. He stood behind me while I went, this is Lemmings 2. <laughs> that was my interaction with Miyamoto. Then came this. So after all that stuff, I got to go and play, basically. Um, Dave would come up with these wacky ideas for, maybe we should try a game like this or this or this. So he set me up just to go, this PC, I'll give you ideas, go and prototype them and see what you come up with. So the first one was a three quarters view, that kind of how to kill your zombie thing, zombie at my neighbor thing kind of view. So I did a little prototype for that. Yeah, no, nah, I don't like that. Um, so while he was thinking of something else, I thought, well, I've never done an isometric game. I quite fancy doing one. So I created this thing. This is a, a, a bitmap just in deep paint that I created to try and figure out how to do isometric games. So oh, okay, I can kind of see it. So I then did something to actually do this and then see a path through. I was able to walk through and stuff. And that was all very good. And it's like, well, you know, this was 90, end of 93, start of 94. It's like, well, that's a bit blasé for this kind of time. So can you make it spin? That'd be quite cool. Came up with this. Now there's a video on my YouTube that you can go and see all this spinning about and stuff. Uh, it's basically still isometric, but with texture map sides, um, what we like to call doom walls, which is basically a vertical texture mapper. So not this kind of freeform polygon thing, just a vertical texture mapper that can kind of skew a bit. 
Because if you think of Doom Wall, that's kind of all it's really doing. Just nice vertical. You could texture map them really quickly. So I did that and basically put this really bad texture map thing on top. And I basically then had something I could spin using an isometric map. Um, and it would just spin around nice and quick. It was, it was interesting. So Dave gave this to one of the teams going, well, that's pretty, let's do that. Um, and they started to, to do it, but they, they had to rewrite the engine because I'd written it in Pascal. So it'd be Highsoft Pascal, not Highsoft, Borland Pascal 7 and inline assembler. So you use Pascal to do all the high level loops and things, and then texture mapping would all be an assembler. And you could just inline it, it was, it was really fun. Um, so they took this and then started to rewrite it in assembler in C, but they were doing it in high res. And it was just struggling because high res at that time was page memory and it was just nasty. So they weren't really getting very far with it. But they had a design doc that actually was very close to GTA 2 in terms of you know, gangs fighting each other, but they were struggling with it. While they were doing that, I was just playing again and thought, well, maybe we can view that differently. So the isometric map was basically just like cubes stacked on top of each other, which is why you kind of see, you know, cube, 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 space, cube, cube, cube. Nothing complicated. Um, so here, same thing, cube, 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 just I'm gonna make big tall things. Now, this was actually, take away the background, the, the road, that wasn't there initially. I was looking at a game called Clockwork Night on Sega Saturn, okay, I guess. <laughs> um, and they had this really nice parallax kind of 3D thing. I thought, well, that's nice, a little platform with a bit of depth there, do that. So I did that, and it was basically all these kind of things as platforms you jump on. And I'm showing some of the guys, and the guys that had started doing body harvest for the N64, which we'd signed up about 94 time, we were starting to do some work on. I said they'd been trying to get a racing game past Dave for years, but Dave just wasn't interested in them. Um, so I thought, well, I, I, I could put a wall on it. So just like Clockwork Night, put a wall there, but paint roads on it. So all of a sudden it kind of looks top down, but it's not really. Um, and then painted a car on it. And I showed Dave this, uh, him and Keith, who was the guy doing the rotating isometric one and kind of panned it about and it looks like a city from top down. So he was really interested in that because he loves this open game thing. Um, if you think about Lemmings, it is an open world game because you can create that level and then people will play it however they want. Use the skills however they want. We could give you skills and you could figure out a totally different way of doing it. So it was interested in kind of doing more of that and this gave him that kind of viewpoint that you could do. I was often asked why it wasn't 3D and GTA would never worked in 3D in those days. You think of the games that came out around the same time, like Carmageddon and so on, they have like one pedestrian. GTA is all about the city being alive and doing things. Loads of cars and stuff. You imagine the power that we need to, at that point to do that and see more than a foot and a half in front of you. would never have worked. So this was good. It gave you a really closed area that you could just work on having a living city in that area. Very fixed viewpoint. And so they started playing with that. Um, the engine was rewritten and it was all 256 color mode and it was all going fine. This one shipped as part of it. You had the 256 color, 32 bit ones and the 3D effects ones. So it was fine, it was all running. And then I kind of messed up a wee bit and, and showed them a 32 bit engine running. Um, so from this point, this was what all the games on the PC kind of looked like. 256 color, that was it, ship it. You look at Quake, it's brown, ours is gray, meh dims of things. Now, I'd happened to be on internet news groups at this point, so this would have been about 96, I think. Um, and there was a discussion going on about high-res modes and, you know, full 32-bit uh, color, 24-bit color. And I said, well, if you could get low-res with that, it might actually be useful, because we don't need high-res, we just want the colors. And then the guys that wrote the UniVB driver happened to be on there as well and went, We've got a new driver coming out. You can do that on just about every card. So there was a discussion back and forward and they sent me a, a beta of their new driver. And so I could kick into a 320-200 mode, 16-bit uh, or 32-bit. And when I was playing with it and doing tests, it turned out that writing a byte, which is what this is, two fifths color, single byte, or 16-bit, which is two bytes, or 32-bit, which is four bytes, were all exactly the same speed, just because of the architecture. Uh, 486s and stuff want to write 32 bits at a time. That's how they're architected. So writing that or 16 or 8 is all the same speed. So at that point you start to say, well, 
you could just be running this, but in full color. So I came up with a little demo of, like, you could do all this stuff, 32 bit, blah, 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 not thinking it was really for this. And they went, yeah, that's really nice. Sod it, let's just do that, okay? So it added about another year to the project because <laughs> I had to do all the graphics again. And not just, like, the, you know, hand-drawn painted stuff. <coughs> they started rendering things and making things nice, and it just took forever. So what we ended up with was still a 256 color graphic source because 32 bit images would have taken up huge amounts of memory. But it's 256 color and they all had their own 256 color palette. So each tile could have its own palette if it wanted. And that kept the memory right down. So you'd read the tile, you'd look up the color and you'd store that. And it would do that really quickly. Um, so that was really cool. We had this new engine which was shown off at shows and all the programmers were flocking around going, how do you do that? Because it was totally new, nobody had done it before. Interestingly, Unreal 1, we had Tim Sweeney over showing us, because we were going to be doing an N64 version, because we had the dev kits, nobody else had them at that point. Um, so we were talking through this and telling them how to do it. Went, oh, yeah, which is why Unreal has 16 and 32-bit mode, because he got it from us. And it was such a simple addition to do. Um, from that, we then went on to, so that was the 32-bit one. You can see it's just each tile is kind of, you know, two-thirds of color, but then when you add it all together, you just get this beautiful color image. Now, from this, we had 3D effects cards. 3D effects had sent us a big stack of 3D cards. Go and do this. Oh, they're lovely. Thank you very much. Pine Quake. And they came up to visit. I said, crap, we've not done anything with it. They're just sitting there. What can we do? What can we do? Oh, I can't write 3D Engine. That's going to take forever. So I was the one that was supplying the graphics library, basically. Um, it wasn't a DLL because it was DOS. It was just a lib they would link in and get a new version. But it was really simple. So I took about a week to convert over. And it was ideal for 3D effects because 3D effects has um, 256 color graphics palettes that you could select the palette, render the graphic, select the palette, render the graphic. Uh, as kind of 3D stuff. So this was ideal. It was already in the right format. I just needed to power it up and draw stuff. So I did a 3D effects demo for them of GTA running. Um, I've since been told, I met one of the 3D effects guys at a show, uh, and he said once he came up, they, they had no idea that you could use it for 2D. They just thought it was always 3D, but obviously 2D is just two triangles, you know, the sprites. And they hadn't realized that at all. So when they came up and saw it around, oh, that's great, that's great. They went away all happy. And then everybody preferred playing the 3D effects version because it was lovely. So although BMG didn't pay for it, we felt we couldn't throw it away because it was too nice. So it shipped with the game. So they got it for free because uh, it's still the best version of GTA. It's just so smooth and fast and high res. It was lovely. Um, Rest in Chase Design Doc is out there. Um, I found it and published it and it's, it's not my site anymore, but it's, it's out in the ether. You can go and find it. Um, and it does take it right back to the start, which is it's an interesting read. I do have the GTA 2 one that I've found that I will release, and it's like this thick, it's huge. Uh, that one wasn't. So after GTA, we did GTA 1, GTA 2, I left to go to a company called Simeon Industries. I've become kind of part of the woodwork at DMA. I was just doing R&D. I was, I was in the same thing. In the early years, I was doing so much different stuff. After about 95, I was just an R&D doing 3D engines. And it was just same, same, same. So. A friend of mine left DMA to start this up. Um, it was for three telecoms, so Hutchinson Mobile, which turned into three. Um, it was when the 3G started coming up. So they were doing all these three handsets. Now, if you remember, after Snake on the Nokia, basically everything went into J2ME kind of phones. That's when you could start programming in Java. So we suddenly thought we could do a whole load of games, real games, um, and we did. So we had three different handset types that we had to code for. One had a screen size of like 70 pixels high. It was a nightmare. It was incredibly slow. Um, to ones that were quite high res at the, at the time. So I did a few shooters, uh, a really nice golf game that I'm kind of slowly remaking because it, it just felt so nice. Um, I came up with this physics thing that wasn't physics at all, but worked really well. So um, I did that and some other kind of games that we did off of these mobiles. Um, the low tier handset I compared to worse than a ZX81. Although it could draw graphics, like bitmap graphics, because that was all kind of built in, the actual processing of things, like trying to move bodies and stuff, 
it didn't have the power of the XM1. It was awful, incredibly slow. And because everything was zipped, we had the 30 k jar space to fit all the program. We'd download assets, but the program had to fit in 30 k Because it was zipped, you couldn't just make things smaller because then the zip might get bigger. Because it was zipped and the patterns would change and we'd go, oh, it's bigger. We also couldn't download to this handset ourselves, So I had to make a change, send it down to 3G on email. They'd run it and tell me what was happening. So we ended up, basically, the initial bit where nothing worked, I put in a whole load of set color, fill the screen with this color, do this, fill the screen with this color, do this. And then they'd go, it's gone red. Oh, right, okay, that's there, right, got to there, fine. And we did this for a couple of nights until suddenly things were working again, or working for the first time. It was, it was horrible. The other fan sets we could kind of get down onto, but the first ones were just a uh, nightmare. Some of these games were good fun. This was a really nice little kind of block game. Was, that was good fun. Um, and then we did a Beano Time Racing thing, which was just a kart game. Um, but it's just a fun kart game with all the Beano characters. I did all the kind of effects, so nice balloons, particle systems and stuff. I did a talk at Aberdeen University about that and scared the Jesus out of them. They're just how to do particle systems and batching things. And yeah, they, they, they didn't like that. Um, but it was great fun. Uh, nice shadows and stuff as well, which I don't think that any of them have. Oh, no, they've got nice shape shadows on that one. Uh, that was the time when I think Doom 3 had just come out and they did all these nice stencil shadows. Um, so I just I copied that for this and then discovered the Voodoo 2, the cheap one, not the Voodoo 2, the GeForce 2 cheap one had a bug that you couldn't do infinite polys on, which is how you did it. So you had to cap them annoyingly. Um, and it was the only card it is, so we had to do extra stuff at the end of it. It was really bugging. However, did a whole load of this stuff. Um, and then this didn't do terribly well, so mo they were going back to doing mobile games. And I seemed to spend my life just taking a game and putting it on yet another handset. That was when all the handset screen sizes changed. And you couldn't just go resize because it wasn't OpenGL or hardware. You had to position everything and move everything. It was horrible. So I just seemed to spend all my time going, another one on here, another one on here. So I got fed up. And I moved to real-time worlds. And they're the ones that did crack down, APB and all that kind of stuff. They brought me in to do the project that they actually started up on, which was to do take GIS data and basically make the world, inflate it from all this map data. They tried it initially, but they didn't quite, they couldn't get it working. So they brought me in to have another play and see if they could get it working. So basically all this kind of map stuff, if you could get the source to that, can you make like a world from it? Besides fun. So if you think about it, there's loads of racing games that go through the real world. So Dave's thing was, well, why not just make one world and everybody could go through that one? In fact, why not make one world and you could be playing one game while another one whizzes off over there and you can watch it. So the idea was to have all these games in this world playing all at once. Sounds great. He got me to try it, so that wasn't so great. However, <laughs> it was interesting to try and take this data and make something that the stack of, it was 11 of them that started with that couldn't quite make it work before. I took a slightly different approach. So first of all, I got NavTech data, which is all the, the roads, which is what this is. The whole of the UK is NavTech, all rendered out. Um, it's about 7 million roads and about 10 million lines, so segments and stuff, um, all rendered out. Um, to see so the white bits of the roads and then I think these are areas, the green bits are all areas. And then you go, okay, we've got that, take NavTech data and con convert it into something I can render, fine. What about some AI to go around all these things? So do some root finding, which is great. So looked up how to do A star algorithms and stuff. There was a book that said, do this, do this, this, this. Okay. This is how you optimize it. Okay. All of a sudden I became the, the AI expert at the, the office because I read a book. Um, so these are all the dodgy little milk trucks. Just, I gave them destinations and off they went doing their thing. And I got a whole load of these all running. So that was interesting, getting all the roads. Okay, there we go. One of the other things that MasterMap, which is the Ordnance Survey map data that makes all these things is, they give you building outlines as well. So, okay, that's the next step. Can we get buildings? Okay, get the outlines in. And you can get satellite data as well. Kind of. Um, so you get kind of this topological stuff which tells you 
what that area, I think it was like 25 meters square, what that is. So, you know, that's concrete or something, and then that's tree and so on like that. So I'll get that in, and then I bake it over a height map that Ordnance Survey also has. They've got really nice height maps down, I think it was down to about 10 meters for the whole of the UK. It's very pretty. Um, and then you drape that over an area, and then you put on those outlines, you extrude them up, stick a flat roof on it, and then all of a sudden you've got this kind of 3D-ish thing. Very good. Randomise some of the colours. This is tree areas that, you know, okay, you could maybe do something with them later on, but you start to get, you know, an actual 3D thing from just 2D map data. Put a bit of shadow on it, because, you know, we're graphics guys and why not? It's fun. Um, and you can, again, start to see it's becoming a bit more gamey, which is good. Um, that's just more of the shadow. That was the shadow map, basically rendered. I'd taken the trees and I'd put, like, um, billboard sprites on instead. Now, I've been doing a whole load of tech with this to see what we could do and how we could speed it up. Um, once we got to the end of this, I think these big things are, are multis, high rises. Um, so again, more trees. So the trees were really easy. You'd, you'd get the area that there's that, you know, that kind of flat poly tree thing. And you'd find that in 2D, you'd make a bounding box, and then you'd, you'd go through going, is this in that area? Yes, okay, we'll stick a tree there. Yes, stick a tree there. And then that would form basically where all these sprites would go. So it's pretty simple. Um, put a bit of shadow on it, isn't that pretty? So that's about a four kilometer area of Dundee. It's always handy doing your own area because then you can, it looks right, it doesn't look right, which is fine. I'll go back to this one. So part of this whole thing was to get basically the world streaming so we can make this thing. So I did a demo um, of this area with AI stuff, that's where all these arrows, you know, route finding, going about their merry way. This was shown to Ordnance Survey, who got really excited because they were wanting to move from 2D maps to have some kind of 3D thing. Um, so they gave us access to the whole of Scotland data. Now, put that into perspective, this area here costs you about 250 quid to buy, and that's four kilometers. The whole of Scotland, quite a bit more expensive. Eventually they gave us the whole of the UK. That's huge amounts of money that they're investing in that so they can get access to the 3D stuff. Um, to do all the streaming, we were trying to come up with tech that would render, because this was back in 2006-ish. So if you think about um, the Microsoft Flight Sim's done, okay, this is basically that bit ground level. If you've ever gone down to ground level of Microsoft Flight Sim, it's not good. It's all weird polys everywhere. So this was designed to be very low level. And the problem with the guys when they first started is they basically concentrated too much on the detail. So they would do a building with like window frames and everything. Go, right, now we need to display 10,000 of these. It just doesn't work. I basically came from the other direction going, I'm going to display a big area. And then as we go in, we'll maybe have a few detailed things. And that works much better. You could get this kind of grand vista. Um, and obviously, you think about the tech and the poly throughput of these things back in 2006, 7, compared to what is now, then it's not bad. Uh, we did have the Unreal guys coming up, because Dave's quite pally with them, Mark Rain. I think, well, I should just use Unreal Engine, whatever version it was at that point. I says, why don't you do like two, two million polys a frame or something? And was, you do that? No, we can't do that. No, it's fine, fine, fine. So it was all uh, our own custom engine. Um, the initial one here was C++. We did move over to C Sharp at that point. Um, once I did this and we showed our surveys, got the whole of Scotland, I did a streaming system that we could fly over the whole of Scotland. I've got a couple of videos there um, that I can show of more of this tech. It's quite interesting. But once we had the whole of the UK, where we could fly over the whole of the UK, Dave went out to get investment. He got about $80 million to do this um, for some big names that were involved with it. And this could have been massive when you think about it. Again, designed to have multiple games in it. Every building was user editable. You could click on a building and go, that one, I'm going to edit. So it's like a big um, wiki, but in 3D. Click on that, edit. There's a nice building there, and then everybody gets that. So the idea was the whole world was user editable, so we didn't have to design every house. The world would design all the houses, usually their own one. Oh, it's my house, I'm going to do that. Um, and we had the editors in, so the demo that was shown was um, 
I would click on a building, edit it, and then it would appear on another machine, all edited. And that all worked. Got this huge investment, then they spent it on ATBB. I won't say any more for legal reasons. So after that, basically they, they, they went down the wrong direction. They put people in charge that shouldn't have really been doing it. So there was a kind of infighting of people that wanted just to get on with stuff and people that just wanted to have meetings and moan about stuff. So everybody wanted to get on with stuff, just went, I'm out here. Uh, sorry, beep. Um, and so I got approached by a guy called Sandy Duncan who had bought Game Maker from Mark Overmars um, a few years earlier. And he had this dream of basically doing a video camera for games. So you give them the basic tool and then that could be put on lots of different things. So you write it once and run it, kind of like Java type thing, run it anywhere, but harness towards games. So Game Maker was basically a Windows thing. So he was looking for somebody to port it to the PlayStation Portable. He'd hired somebody to port it to um, C++ because it was all Delphi. And then he was looking for somebody to port that C++ everywhere. So I pointed to somebody, oh, you might do it. And he's going, no, I don't want it. Well, I might. I managed to rope in Russell Kay as well, who was at Visual Science, uh, was at Real Time Worlds at the time. Um, it's really hard to do stuff like this on your own because when you're doing a day job, that's similar. So I figured the two of us, we can kind of push each other a wee bit better. So we did the port, ended up having to scrap huge chunks of this code because it was supposed to be a portable C runner but had MFC and everything in it. And if you know anything about Windows, MFC is Microsoft Foundation classes and it's all about Windows. So we spent months just ripping all that out and, and making it work. And eventually we got it running on the PSP and got a couple of games that we just took over and ran. So Sandy was elated and decided that he's going to start a company. And we did do it in Sheffield or Dundee, didn't really care where. I was wanting out of real time worlds. So I went, do it here, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. So we started basically doing the runner and trying to get games through. Um, at the same time, this is Game Maker 8 one, I think this is. Um, we did updates to Game Maker 8, um, which was all Delphi. Now, I've obviously been doing Pascal back on Amiga and PC. Um, I love Pascal until I use Delphi. But it was still familiar. It was fine. So I did updates to this. I, I put in like zooming map editors and, and 3D features and a whole load of stuff. And it was great fun. Um, just to give an update and uh, Sandy could sell it a bit better. Uh, while we did basic user games that we would then put onto consoles and mobile phones and all that kind of stuff. So we did, I, we ported the runner to um, iOS, Android, and then we would invite people to submit the games and then we would publish them for them. So that, that was all going on in the background while we did a whole lot of other things. We then did Game Maker Studio because everybody was going, that sounds great, but I'd rather publish it myself. You got the tools for it. Yeah, we do, okay, fine. So we basically bundled all that into a nice tool where you could write your game and then go click and it would just, out we go. Um, which is the, the biggest difference between Game Maker and Unity, which everybody go, oh, Unity, Unity. If you want to port to a different game in Unity, you go click, select Android, and then wait for 20 minutes as well. I'm converting everything, hang on a second. Okay, right, convert it back. Oh, wait a minute, I'll go and do that again. So every time you want to switch, it's a nightmare. It's Game Maker, drop down menu, export. It's really fast. So you've got a very quick turnaround, particularly for 2D games. So we did get Game Maker Studio, great fun. Um, did really well. Um, we really wanted to get it onto Mac because it was all still Delphi. It was basically just extended and skinned. So we started to rewrite stuff, um, which was Game Maker Studio 2. Um, was designed from the ground up. I did all the architecture of that, that was good. Um, it's all basically OpenGL, so there's no normal gadgets in there. It's basically an OpenGL screen, then we draw everything. So we've wrote our own text editors, window handling, absolutely everything. Um, that was great fun. Um, and same kind of thing, pick stuff, export. We were able to put in a whole lot of new tech. So tile maps and stuff like you get from the old consoles, properly done, so they were fast. You have loads of layers of parallax if you want for your 2G games. It's great fun. Um, and then after this, um, Playtech were downsizing, offered me redundancy, okay. Um, 
they, they, they neglected to look and see that I had a six month leaving period. So my redundancy had six months of paid leave, which was fab. Um, and then I went to do my own stuff for a couple of years. And then since then, I've joined Sumo Digital, who are a fab company. And they're doing AAA stuff and I'm doing tools for them. Which I don't have any slides, because it's all closed and hidden. Um, and that's it. So that's where I am at the moment. And this doesn't even cover all the crap I've done at night. <laughs> so I've done a whole lot of emulators, little tech demos, uh, involved in Spectrum Next stuff, where I've done loads of techs and an emulator for that to run all in my spare time. <laughs> Getting evils from the corner. <laughs> um, for me, doing stuff, whatever, whatever I'm doing during the day, I try to do something opposite at night. So if I'm doing high-end 3D stuff during the day, I like to do retro stuff at night. If I'm doing basic 2D games there, I'll do high-end 3D stuff at home because it keeps you kind of thinking and doing stuff different. Old machines are great fun because they still push the way you think. When I was doing, I've got a plus four shooter that I've been doing for like 20 years. It's still not finished. Um, but I came up with a new way of allocating. Um, normally in the, the simplest allocation would just be, there's an array of them, look through, find one, there you go. But the more you look through, the longer it takes. And that was really hurting this plus four game that's like one and a bit megahertz. So I came up with a really nice stack allegation thing that was the same no matter what. And I suddenly realized you could use this everywhere. So there's an article in Game Programming Gems 8 book with this stack allocation. And I wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't done all this retro stuff. So you've got to keep doing different things all the time to be able to appreciate, you know, the restrictions that you just don't get anymore on these big machines. Um, so doing all this old stuff is still you know, programming them and poking them and making, making them do things is still you know, what keeps you going. Because um, big PCs are just, they just tick over and do everything. You know, they're just so simple. Um, and that's where I am just now. Thank you very much. I have no idea how long that was. <laughs> um. Who, whose idea was it for the exploding lemming and whose voice was the... Oh, no. So, Dave loved Defender, absolutely loved it, and he wanted that explosion. So, you think about lemmings, you, always, you can get stuck real easily, so you have to abort the level somehow. Loving that and loving Defender, he went, well, you know, there you go. So he did this exploding thing. Um, Scott Johnson, I think it was, that did a little particle system to generate this thing. It's basically a point cloud animation. So it was because of Defender, put that in, solved that, and then all the Lemmings voices in the first one were done by Scott Johnson's mum. Brian Johnson did a whole lot of music for it, which is his brother, and Scott did all the, Scott Johnson's mum did all the voices. Sped up, but did all the voices. Later on, a guy called Alistair Houston, who was a programmer at DMA, could do a really good Lemmings voice without speeding it up. So he actually did a whole load of them later. Um, but the first ones were done by Scott's mum. Hello. Just wanted to say thank you so much for making Game Maker Studio 2. <laughs> I literally released the game on Kickstarter last year. It's brilliant. And I just wanted to know, is it right that Hotline Miami was made? Game yeah, we met them at the at shows. Um, was it Cactus and another guy that, that kind of made it? Uh, Cactus is a bit of a recluse. Um, but he was out with uh, the publisher one time, so we got to meet them. Um, and yeah, I think it was Game Maker 7, the first ones, and they've been upgraded since then. I don't know about the later ones, but certainly the first, first one was. The number of virtual lemmings that you unleashed on the world? <laughs> Billions? Trillions? <laughs> well, they do get culled now and again, so it can't be that many left. I did actually, when I was at Real Time Worlds, doing all this high-end 3D tech, you notice the, the, the trees that were there. Now, when we rewrote the engine in C Sharp, and we started to do the streaming world, we needed to print a lot more trees. So I had this idea for doing basically billboard sprites, like lots of them for doing trees. And I tested it by seeing how many lemmings I could get on the screen. I did hit a million lemming screen demo. <laughs> um, I do have a demo up on my YouTube that is 50,000. It's quite quick, but I did a million at about 17 frames a second, which was the original speed of the Amiga one. And it just covers the screen. Uh, just to prove they were all moving, you could click and there'd be an explosion of them all just blasting about over the place. Um, and it was all done through kind of fast shaders and stuff. Um, these days, God, you must be topping like 10 million or more that you could get on a single screen. Um, was there a skill that didn't make it into the game um, that you really wanted? 
don't think so. I mean, Lemmings won, Dave and Gary did all the skills, and we just got handed that in the level of the, there you go. So I don't know if they had any that they, they dropped before. Lemmings 2, there was a whole lot of skills that shouldn't have gone in, because there was way too many. So I think they were struggling to think up skills at that point. Um, I don't think there was any that were dropped um, back after levels were done or anything. No, there was a, I said, Lemmings 2 had too many. There should have been maybe 10 or 15, and that would be about it. Um, on 8 and 16-bit systems, uh, piracy was obviously massive. What was the general sentiment in Psygnosis about piracy and was there a lot of effort put into anti-piracy measures? Um, I don't know about Psygnosis because they obviously weren't there day to day. Um, for us, it was just part of it. I mean, back in the day, we, we all had copy games. Um, anything that was particularly good or boxed, you, you might buy. I bought hold of... Um, Monk Island and stuff like that, Crystal Corpse and you know the bigger games that you know nice boxes and things um, when you could afford it. But before that, I, mean, I couldn't afford anything. So I, I think we were kind of all came from and Dave came from a cracking group, the Kent team. He was involved in them for years. So it was just kind of you know part of the trade. I think the fact that Lemons got into the box of the Amiga was really what made the difference because you didn't have to depend on everybody, everybody just got given one. Basically, but even up until then, um, Menace sold 20,000 copies and Blood Money 40,000, and then day one Lemmings was 55,000. So, you know, it was a huge uptick anyway. And then with the Commodore deal, it's just, I don't know how much they got, it wasn't a lot, but there were so many of them. It was just, it didn't matter. Um, so, we didn't really, you know, take huge steps to stop them. I know Russell, when he did PC one, put a little bit of protection by writing to the boot sector or something of the floppy that just made it a bit annoying to try and copy. Um, but folk got around it eventually. Um, but it wasn't the huge efforts, because people would copy them. So the best copy one was when I was at um, uh, Visual Sciences and we were doing uh, F1 2000 for EA. Um, that's when, the, you know, obviously PlayStation taking a lot more interest in copy protection. We used a system called LibCrypt, which reliably told you when the disk had been copied. Um, so from then, I put in a whole load of stuff to basically protect, to compress disk sectors and then uncompress them in real time as they loaded in. And then when I knew the disk had been hacked, I would start putting in bits that would kind of decay the game so that you'd have to do like a full lap of the race before it would go, no, you're not going to do that anymore. So it took hackers a good couple of weeks to hack and, and take this out. And all the people that wanted to sell the hacks kept going on the hacker boards because we were following them all on the boards. It was great fun. Um, okay. Complaining, why are you getting this? is ridiculous. To the point that the hackers almost told them all to sod off they're not doing it because they're just fed up with them, this demand to, to fix this thing so they could sell it because they were just doing it for the fun of it and got all these people wanting to sell it and make money from it. So we almost got to a point where nobody was going to hack it. But they did manage to do it eventually um, but held them off for two weeks. And we did see the sales for it and the sales were like, you know, Bumph. As soon as it was hacked, dropped like a stone. So, which is, it was interesting, but it will, everything gets hacked eventually. It's just about delaying it. And those two weeks is about the time where they say that's what you want. You want to get two weeks out of it. That's when your big sales thing is. Um, so and I was well chuffed that we managed to get, um, get that kind of time because it was, it was unheard of. No. Yeah, what, what's your um, favorite retro machine that you still enjoy writing oh, for and using today? Too many. Um, I love them all. I really do. Um, if I had infinite time, I, I would be doing stuff on all of them. Um, Spectrum, I'm so involved with Spect Spectrum Next, guys. Um, I'm doing a whole load of games. I've got like three games that are half written on there. I'm doing a Port of Super Crate Box, which is a Game Maker game. Um, I'm doing a, I've got Wolfenstein 3D Engine that's written that just needs a game put into it. Um, I'm doing a Port of Lemmings for it. So when you think of the Spectrum one, it's pretty slow and horrible. This one's full speed, beats the Amiga in a lot of places in terms of speed. Um, and then I've got just tech demos I'm doing on it. It's such a fun machine to write for because there's so much hardware in it. Um, I'm desperate to write something else on the SNES that isn't Lemmings because it's everything's done with the processor, which is really annoying. It's got all this hardware. So I'd love to write something on that. Mega Drive I was never able to write on. I, I did get a dev kit and went, start, do something else. Oh, bugger, okay. Um, so I'd love to write on that. Um, PlayStation, I, oh, I did some really cool stuff on PlayStation. 
uh, of visual sciences. When we were doing um, the F1 games, um, just before we started that, Russell was going off to buy in dev kits and they were about 1500 quid a piece and he needed like 10 or 20 of them. So he gave me this action replay and went, oh, I've heard people can hack this. What do you can do with it? All right, Mr. Innocent, oh, there you go. Um, and I managed to get basically the official dev kit talking to the action replay as though it was a dev kit. So you can compile, send it down, debug. It took me a while to get the debugging because there was a weird trick with it in that when it single stepped, it had to flush the cache. So it's a 4K cache in the PlayStation. And if you poke into it, the cache is already filled, so it's got the old instruction. So you have to flush the cache to get the new one with the breakpoint in it. It took me ages to figure that out. Look, I was stepping once and it just runs. <coughs> but I finally got it working. And then Russell came back and went, oh, great, I was going to have to buy dev kits. Now we'll pay 10 quid and get a whole load of these cartridges. <laughs> okay. So I had to go and finish it off. But it was basically the dev kit had a little comm driver that it would send commands to and then it would send them out to the SCSI or card or something. And I just wrote my own one that sent it out to the parallel port and then I would handle everything on the side and do all the debugging stuff. So we, we did a 10 quid official dev kit effectively. It was great. Um, he then went and got proper cartridges made with extra RAM. Because of course the dev kits come with extra RAM in them so you could do debug builds. You couldn't do that on these dev kits. But we added two meg of extra RAM so we could do proper debug builds. Um, and I basically got to program these cartridges and do stuff with it. I turned one into an actual action replay, like the 64 where I could snapshot at any time, save it all down, and then reload it all and carry on, uh, which was great fun. We actually used it for testing so that basically if the game crashed, the tester could flick the switch, because testers wouldn't have got dev kits back in those days, way too expensive. So they all got one of these, flick the switch when it crashed, run a, a program, and it would download everything, zip it all up, upload it to a website, put in a bug report, then a programmer would come along, go download that, it would expand into memory, they would get the symbol table, they could just start debugging it from where it crashed. Just a head of it, it was brilliant. Um, so I had great fun doing all these things. Um, so the Amiga as well, so the PSX I'd love to do more with because it's also MIPS, which is my favorite language. Um, same with PlayStation 2 again. I used to love doing that. I did a whole load of stuff with that as well. I hacked the ROM because um, I got a, one of the big toolkits. Um, and I hacked the ROM to put in, I did a profiler before the official profiler came out. So EA had given us the game. I was, pro, I was running the game through my profiler and said, oh, you go around this corner. Here's a profile. Oh, we don't have that yet. Could you send us that? There you go. I did uh, Bezier patch stuff um, on it so you could do nice curvy roads and everything. Again, sure, EA and they were all excited about it. All of these machines have something that's just interesting and fun to play with. So I think up until I kind of stopped, PlayStation 3 I didn't really get into. But everything below is so much fun because they're all different and unique. I mean, even like Dreamcast and stuff, I did a whole lot of Dreamcast things. I love the Power VR because it's so different. Um, one of the things that wasn't really used in the Power VR is you could do light volumes. So you had your 3D scene and then you could make this volume in 3D space and it could change properties of things went through this volume and rendered. So you could do like headlights and stuff with these things or shadows or whatever. It's really cool. Never got to play with any of that. So every machine from PS2 down. <laughs> yeah. Aquarius. I, I could use it as a doorstop, I'm sure. I mean, they all have the chance. I mean, you look at things like the Auric which would be interesting, but the screen format is wild. Some weird interleaved thing. Because I happened to look and go, there eh, wasn't a lot of games on that, was it? Oh, geez, no wonder. Um, <laughs> but it'd be fun to play and see what you could do. It's like the plus four when I started, like, the plus four I made that crappy game. It's fine. But then, when was it, 1999, I was doing my emulator for the plus four. That was my first emulator. And I was playing a whole lot of games, and I was thinking, you know, I wonder what you could do now with the knowledge you've got about all the 3D stuff and all your program things that you didn't know back then, what could you do? So I did this shoot 'em up game that has is it 10 software sprites all moving on. Plus four, that was unheard of. All masked, all proper, nice like full screen scrolling and everything. Because it was using kind of texture caching techniques and barrel shifting sprites and everything. And what you can take back from now to these old machines is amazing. So it's the same thing. It's just every machine gives you something of a challenge. So all these old machines, they'll have to do some of the art just to see what that screen is. See if you can do something different from what was there. 
I have no idea what the Aquarius is like in Harvard. I should really look it up just to see what I saved myself from. Um, I do have a Vectrex as well, and I got one of the catchers where you could program, put your stuff on and program it. Um, because I love to do vector stuff to see, because they were so cool. It's just smooth vectors, it'd be amazing. Um, yeah, I don't know a machine, an old machine that I wouldn't fiddle with in some shape or form. It's like that PC effects thing. Yeah, which I got, yeah, it's up there, which I got to see what it was like, and it's like, ah, oh, it's just a big arm. Yeah, that's boring. You want something with, you know, a bit of character and something weird about it, just to, to pique your interest. Um, and all, most of all these old machines have that. Uh, right down to the old NES and stuff, you know, they're all party stuff. Game Boy was great fun as well, although it had no index register, which made it a nightmare. But you still do stuff on it because it's fun. So I asked you then, working on Super Nintendo, was that a difficult system to work for? Because there's a big homebrew scene on the yeah. Mega Drive, but there's not much on the Super Nintendo right now. I mean, people didn't like the, the, the SNES because it was, the CPU wasn't particularly fast. You know, it was three and a half megahertz for the, for register based stuff and about two and a half for memory things. So you had to really work to make it, which is why some of their games kind of slowed down. But if you kind of persevered and knew what you were doing, you can do some amazing things with it. Did Nintendo get involved much or did you literally have free roaming? What? Well, it was, I mean, it was Liming. There was a Liming's port, so. No, with uh, Uni Racers. Uni, oh no, they were heavily involved. Yeah, I mean, it was a proper third party title for them. So uh, first party title, I have no idea the terminology. Yeah, um, it was their game that we were doing um, and obviously we had all the lawsuit and stuff so it's quite a rare game now there was only 300,000 made um, but it was it was yeah heavily Nintendoized in terms of looking at it and judging it and asking for things and stuff uh, they were the ones that wanted the printouts so they sent us an A0 printer um, which was great fun we used to print out all these posters I think GTA guys used it you see it in that um, documentary the GTA the big map that they printed that was from that. So I used it, I did the driver, printed out a few things, then they stole it from me. Mm -hmm. And I went over to GTA guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything Nintendo, they're heavily involved. Same with Body Harvest and stuff. There, there was big fights with Body Harvest, I heard. I wasn't involved in that, but I know the guys would be going back and forth between the American Nintendo, Japanese Nintendo, and just, they wanted polar opposites all in the same game. So it was, it was just a nightmare, uh, according to them. Great, well, thank you again. Thank you much. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's episode. If you enjoyed it and like what I do on the channel, join the official cave dwellers over at patreon.com forward slash RMC Retro.